Hi everyone. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to go through with you some tips for writing up the classroom observation instrument. So this is part of unit two, the Trinity Diploma in TESOL. I think writing up this assignment can be really challenging if you've not done any academic writing for a while. It can also be really challenging because it's quite a tight word count of just 3,000 words or the absolute limit 3,300. I'm going to go through with you what to include in each section and some sort of common mistakes that I find candidates make when writing this up. Before we go into the write-up though, I'm just going to go back over some of the basics to check that you've got the basic requirements right because if not, you're really going to be building on sand. So the first thing is that you should already by this point, by the time you come to writing up, have done 10 hours of guided observation and the teachers you've observed should have either a diploma or a delta or something similar and one year post-qualification teaching experience or a formal pre-service qualification. So CELTA, CERT TESOL or something similar to that and three years post-qualification experience of teaching. You did all your observations live, so they were you in the classroom, not video recordings. And even though you've done 10 hours, or you should have done 10 hours by this point of observation, you don't actually have to base your report on all 10 hours. You can base it on at least six hours. All right, so let's go into some of those tips for writing up. So in terms of the marks for the observation instrument, there's only four criteria. So the criteria are related to firstly the rationale before you do any of the observations. The second is the revision process. Third is the evaluation. And finally, the presentation. So I'll also, also break this talk down into those four sections and hopefully that should help make things clear. So first of all, let's talk about the rationale. 20% of the mark comes from your rationale. So I would always recommend that if it's 20% of the mark, you use around 20% of the word count. So if you've used only 10% or if you use 50%, then I recommend that you change that to make it match a little bit more closely. In terms of what actually needs to be in the rationale, you need to include a little bit about your personal context. So you and where you teach, so where you work, who your students are, anything that makes your context unusual, and try to avoid any jargon that your school might use. So instead of so some schools, for example, have specific names for like student age groups. Just try and say young learners aged such and such an age, or instead of saying, you know, book G in such and such a course, say roughly what level they are on the CEFR. And the idea behind that is it should be much more easy for whoever's reading it to understand what you're talking about. You also need to include the topic and why you're interested in it. The person reading it wants to know your motivation, your personal motivation for investigating it. Try to avoid saying things like, you know, this is a problem that teachers generally have. This whole project is really about you and your teaching. It's not about you trying to create a paper that's going to change the world of language teaching. It's really all about you trying to improve your teaching. So talk about your own personal reason for working on this topic. It might be something, for example, that you read about on this course and you found that it's something you'd like to learn more about. It might be something you feel that you've never been able to do particularly well in class and you'd like to improve on. Anything like that, but make sure it's personal. And also say what you hope to learn from this process. And one more time, the focus has to be on improving your teaching, not helping others. So the whole basis of this project is that you can learn more about teaching through observing other people in your context. So although you need to talk about your personal motivation and your context and everything, you do also need to do a bit of background reading and ground whatever you're doing in some published materials. So whatever the topic is, make sure you do some background reading on it, include some references, flesh out the topic a bit, show whoever's marking this that you have an understanding of the topic. And whatever you write about here really has to form the basis of what you're going to observe. So for example, if you're looking at error correction and different ways of correcting errors, well, make sure then that whatever you write here then logically corresponds with whatever you have in your first observation form. Talk about that more in a minute. Make sure you've got a variety of references. I would say at least five or six. You know, you don't want to just quote Jeremy Harmer six times, right? Try to make sure you've got a variety of different sources of people who've, who've written about this topic. And again, make sure whatever 
you talk about here relates to what you're going to observe later. So in this section, you also need to write your aim. So that's what you hope to achieve from this topic. Again, you can write this retrospectively. You don't have to write this at the beginning. You might find that what you ended up learning from the topic might have been different. So it's okay to change your aim. Make the aim really, really clear. So signpost that for your reader. And again, I've, I've said it before, but I'll say it again, your aim here has to be about improving your own teaching. So you're not aiming to go in and judge other teachers. You're not aiming to create an observation form that's going to help other teachers improve. Your aim has to be about learning from other teachers and how that can improve your own teaching. Although this is observation, this is all based on, it's not supervisory observation. You're not going in and deciding if other teachers are doing a good job or a bad job. You're observing other people and learning from them. All right, and the final thing that needs to go in this rationale section is something about your first observation instrument. Everything that you've written up to this point should lead towards that first instrument. So it really needs to follow on logically from what you've said in the rationale and introduction. So let's take something else like instruction giving. Maybe you've read about different ways of giving instructions, demonstrating, checking, understanding, and monitoring afterwards. If that's in your reading, make sure that your first instrument corresponds to that, right? And that there's places to record those things. And in the actual report, include the observation instrument, right? So the person reading this should be able to see the actual instrument that you've used. Okay, so that's the rationale. So the next section is really the observation process. And so this is 25% of the mark here comes from this. The marking criteria for this say that this is about the rationale for the revision process, leading to at least two additional observation instruments with the same initial themes. In other words, you've got your first instrument, you're going to revise it twice, and this section is all about that revision process. How did you change your observation instrument? So a few things you have to include in here are what those updated observation instruments look like. So make sure you take a screenshot or a photo or whatever, and you stick it in. Remember, in total, there have to be three observation instruments, but you could include more if you want, if you ended up doing more revisions. But a lot of the marks here are really for you discussing the revision process, right? So you want to talk about, I observed these classes, these are things I noticed in the classes, but also I found these problems with my observation instrument, so I decided to change it. But why did you decide to change it? Well, I mean, some typical reasons for updating the instrument might be things like the practicality of using it. You might find that, you know, maybe you had a observation instrument with boxes and the boxes were too small, or maybe you were intending to write down what teachers and students said, but you found it just didn't fit or there wasn't enough time to write those things down. You might have found that maybe in class, there were things that you noticed that there was just wasn't a space to capture in the instrument. For example, maybe you're investigating group work and you found that teachers were using the student's first language quite a lot in setting up group work and you didn't have anywhere to capture that on the observation form. That might be a reason to then update the form. And a final reason, I guess, is any further reading on this topic that you might have done after starting the observation process. So obviously in an ideal world, you would have read everything beforehand, but you know, maybe you did actually find some other articles or some other information about this topic after you'd already started and that caused you to update your instrument. And remember this whole section has to be based on at least six hours of observed classes so you could discard four hours of the observations if you want to. So for example if you were looking at pronunciation and you found that in four of the ten hours that you observed there was no pronunciation practice that's okay right? You can still base it on the remaining six hours. I think it's also useful here just to give a little bit of information maybe about the classes that you're observing, the teachers you're observing. So how big are the classes, the levels of students, the ages of the students, where you are in the world, are these multilingual classes, are they monolingual classes, are they young learners, very young learners, adults, university students. Tell us a bit about who you're observing. And obviously who you observe really needs to make sense in terms of your initial aim as well. So if at the beginning you've said that I really want to investigate classroom management with very young learners, well, <laughs> make sure you're not observing groups of adults later on because that doesn't make any sense, right? So, so make sure that those match up logically again. 
All right, finally, let's talk about the evaluation. So this is where 40% of the marks come from. So again, this really ought to be the, the lion's share of the word count in your report here. And obviously in terms of marks, this is the most important thing. So the first thing you need to include here is an evaluation of your final observation instrument. So hopefully this should be pretty good by now, right? You should have revised it at least twice. So talk a bit about how effective this was at gathering data that was gonna help you achieve your aim. But try to be balanced as well. Don't just talk about how great it was. Presumably there are some problems. So again, try to be reflective on that. Show an awareness of the limitations of your instrument, but also show what worked well. You also wanna present your results. So you need to show that hopefully you found some useful information in your observations that relate back to your aim. But you also need to present this in a way that's understandable to the reader. Now again, this very much depends on what your aim is and why you're investigating this topic. But I think a common mistake people make here is just including graph after graph of information, how many instruction checking questions teachers asked or how many errors were corrected. Be a little bit careful with that, right? Make sure that whatever you're presenting it has to be meaningful in some way. I mean, if you find that teachers are correcting 50% of errors in classes, I mean, so what? Is that is that really helping you achieve your aim here of finding better ways to correct students? I would guess not. And I would guess probably more what you want to include here is examples maybe of best practices that you saw from teachers. Things that you can use in future in class yourself. I'm not saying don't use graphs, of course, but just make sure that if you include them, there's actually a reason for including them. And then finally, the implications. Here, you're really thinking right back to the start. When you embarked on this project in the first place, what was your reason for doing it? What were you hoping to achieve? Go back to your aim and tell us what did you discover that could help you improve your teaching. Now, another common mistake I find that people make here is they tell us what Jeremy Harmer or Jim Scrivener or Penny Ur or someone like that thinks good group work or good instruction giving or good error correction or whatever it is, what those things should be. But these implications have to be things that you've discovered yourself from your observation process. Because of course, I mean, Jeremy Harmer and Penny Ur, they've never been to your school. They probably don't know your context, but you do. And by going through this process of observation, hopefully you've come to some new realizations about what you should be doing in class. Hopefully, some of them might be different from what you were doing before. So make sure that those implications relate to the things that you found in, in class and show some evidence for them. You might say that I, I noticed this other teacher who used songs with very young learners whenever the young learners were getting distracted and that helped them prevent any sort of behavior management issues. And therefore, something I'm gonna do in future is use songs with blah, blah, blah. At the same time, you can also relate these back to things that you spoke about in the beginning and the rationale. So for example, maybe some of the reading that you did at the beginning suggested some good practices. You could find like, were teachers doing these? Did these work, etc. And if you have some extra words left over, well, you might wanna also talk about maybe the implications for other teachers in the school. Maybe if you found some great practices, then you could share them with other teachers through a workshop and you could include the workshop in an appendix, something like that. So I mentioned appendices there. A couple of things that's really important to include there. First of all, there's a pro forma. So that just means a form basically, where you get all the teachers that you observed to sign that, to acknowledge that you observed their classes and you didn't just make all this up. Remember, hopefully you've observed a range of teachers and also include scans of the observation tasks. You don't need to type them up, scan them or take photos of them or whatever, right? But just make sure that they're in the appendices so that the person reading can check that you did actually do those observations. All right, so that's it for writing up the COI. So just to summarize, at the beginning and the rationale, talk about who you are, why you're interested in this topic, have a bit of background reading about the topic, see what your aim is, and make sure that your instrument captures all of those things. The next bit, the revisions, make sure you have logical reasons for why you've changed your instrument and they can be based on the practicality of using it, the instrument capturing or not capturing things in class or even any extra reading that you've done afterwards. And then finally, the evaluation, make sure that in there you evaluate the final instrument, 
you present your results in a clear way that makes sense and that you draw implications, right? You get conclusions, things that you can actually practically use in your teaching in future that have come from those results. I hope that's helpful. Best of luck writing up your classroom observation instrument.